Good morning, everyone. Are you able to see me? I'm not seeing myself just yet. I'm hoping that everything is up and running right now. Can anybody give me a little... Here we go. I see myself now. All right. I see several people signing in and continuing to sign in. I tried something a little bit different this morning. I went with a timer prior to signing on and give everybody a, a few minutes before I actually came on screen to chance to log in if they wanted to a little bit early. Uh, I think that that seems to have worked. Uh, it's something that I just learned the last few days how to do as far as putting a timer on this live stream. So uh, if it didn't work out the way I wanted it to, I apologize. But I think and I believe that I saw several signing on uh, before I came on the screen this morning. It is good to see or be with everyone. I know I can't see you face to face, but it's good to see everyone here this morning, so to speak. And uh, I'm glad that you've joined me uh, live for this broadcast this morning. As you can see by looking at the slide there on the screen, Amazing Grace, the first Sunday of the month, as we've done, as I said earlier in the year, is the theme for the year of 2020 for us. And the first Sunday morning of every month is devoted to the subject of talking about God's grace. We sing that song quite often, Amazing Grace. It is a song that's almost 250 years old, and it's it's withstood the test of time. It doesn't matter what age you are, that this song has a special meaning to so many people. We sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And what I do when I look at this and I consider all this, you've heard me say this many times, that I stand in awe of God, and, and creation in general is one of those things that, that truly makes me stand in awe of God. I can go outside, and I can look around at nature and see it. But Cindy and I, when we, first, when we moved to Portales, New Mexico, back around 1998, <clears throat> we uh, dis discovered a, a, a little town called Riodoso. Some friends of ours there in Portales told us about it, and it became a place that we like to go a lot. And I say a lot, once once or twice a year maybe we would get over there and spend a few days. But the scene that you see on the screen right now is Sierra Blanca. That is the mountain that the Ski Apache Ski Resort resides on there just outside of Riodoso, New Mexico. And we would like to drive there. And one of the things that I always remember was driving from Portales to Roswell. It was a flat drive. It was a boring drive. And we get into Roswell. We make that right-hand turn to where we start going toward uh, Riodosa. And all of a sudden, the terrain starts to change. And off in the distance, after a certain, this, you know, after we've been on that highway for about five minutes after we've turned out of Roswell, you can start to see the peak of Sierra Blanca. And it was a beautiful sight. I remember one year that Cindy and I drove up to the top of the mountain, had the boys with us in the car. And we're driving around this road going up to the ski lodge, and, and it's a windy road, hairpin turns everywhere, you can't go very fast. You get to a certain point on the road, it tells you that you need four-wheel drive and chains on your tires in order to be able to get up there. Well, we went at the end of the ski season, so the road was not had no snow on it at that time. But I just remember that as we're driving up the road and winding around on the side of this mountain, one of the boys look, would peek up over the edge of the door and slink back down in his seat and say, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And we didn't. We got up there and we got back down nice and safe. But it was just a beautiful, beautiful picture. 
I've had the good fortune, I, I consider it a good fortune, to be able to to walk the rim of a dead volcano in northeast New Mexico, Capulin Volcano. It's a dead volcano, but walking around the rim of it, and it, it's about a mile and a half around the rim when you walk it, and walking around it, you get a very good view of the plains and the high plains, and, and you get a good view. of You can actually see over into Colorado from there. And it was, it was just beautiful. I stand in awe of God's creation. It brings me in awe, and it, it, those types of things draw me closer to God when I'm able to be out there. And I've, only, I've got limited experience as far as travel goes. Then you have this also, that something that draws me even closer to God and I believe that is his scriptures. It's in the scriptures that when I go there and, and visit and read, I am able to draw even closer to the Lord at that time. I look forward to that. I want to be closer to God in, in all things. And, and so it is interesting to me to, to see what people do See what people say about God's scriptures. One of the passages is probably one of the favorites of all time is Psalm 23, where David starts out, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And people read that, and it, it calms them. It draws them closer to God. It brings them, produces a reverence toward God that increases as, as they read it. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Isaiah chapter 53, the prophecy of the Lamb of God, what he will do when he will come into this world, how he will be led to the slaughter like, like a sheep led to the slaughter, how he will bear the sins of, of the many of the world in his body. And it just it's a beautiful picture of, of what is going to happen in our Savior. I love reading the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is one of those passages of Scripture that as a preacher it makes me realize how poor a communicator I actually am compared to Jesus Christ. He taught with all authority. He taught as one having authority because he was the author. But it's one of those text passages of scripture that when I look at it, and you may have your own favorite text. You may have a text that you enjoy completely, and it does that very same thing to you. It brings you in awe of your creator. It makes you stand there almost with your mouth dropped open, but there is, it produces such a reverence toward God that you just are in amazement. So we stand amazed even in the presence of God, don't we? Now, I want you to consider this because the epic accounts that are found within the scriptures, within the pages of our Bible, they help us ascend to the throne of God. And our text this morning, if you have your Bible, you can turn Bibles open. Open it to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading in verse 14 here in just a moment. And we will read this together. And we'll talk about this. It is in this text, again, that we're going to base our lesson, a subject of grace this morning. We might subtitle this lesson, I can't, but God can. And I, I believe that God can do all things. So let's read this text together, and then we'll look, examine it a little bit closer as we move along this morning. It says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, what a beautiful passage of scripture to, to read and, and to, to examine together this morning. And, and what you find in this, in this text 
is Paul's second prayer, so to speak, in, in this particular epistle. As he's writing to the church at Ephesus, he first prayed in chapter 1 that they may know the power of God. In chapter 3, in the text that we just read, what he's praying there is that we will use the power of God. Not only use it, but to raise us and draw us closer to God, to bring it, so to speak, climb to greater heights. As children of God, one of the things that I'm aware of is that my life cannot stay the same. I must continue to grow. I must continue to increase in my knowledge of the Savior. I must continue to mature. And as I mature, I move closer and closer to God. And that's what an approach to the Scriptures helps us do. It draws us closer. It brings us to greater heights in our relationship even to God. Well, in this second prayer, what we see by going back to verse 1 is there is somewhat of a parenthetical insert by by Paul here, beginning in verses 1 through 13. And there he talks about this great mystery which has been revealed. But what verse 14 does is it reconnects us back to chapter 2 and verse 22, where it says, In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so verse 14, when he starts out there then, for this reason... It's going back to that particular text, to that verse. And so we ask the question, well, for what reason then has he done this? Well, because of who we are is why he's done this. Because of who we are as children of God, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Well, that just gets me thinking again. Such amazing grace. But not only amazing grace, because of this grace, the, bo- the book of Ephesians speaks of, of our wealth. Really, it's, it talks about our spiritual blessings. It talks about the amazing riches because of God's grace that we have. You consider that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, what does the Apostle Paul say? Well, we're blessed. And he starts out by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has done what? Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, where? In the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing we've been blessed with. You drop down to verse 7 of chapter 1. What do you see? Immediately it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. How rich do you feel? Do you feel like you, as a child of God, are are some of the wealthiest people in the world. And I'm not talking monetarily. I'm not talking about the richest man in the world because what I want to suggest to you is the richest man in the world, if he's not a child of God, he's not as rich as you and me. Look at chapter 2 and verse 4. The Apostle Paul goes on there and says, But God, who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. He's rich in mercy. Chapter 3 and verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. When you imagine, you know, I've got dollar bills and gold bars for the background for that slide that you're looking at. But imagine the unsearchable riches that are found in Jesus Christ. It is a wonder to us. It amazes us. But does it actually change your demeanor toward God? Does it change your demeanor toward His Son? Does it bring you to a deeper reverence of Him? Does it make you realize that like the song that we sing, this is my Father's world? It's not ours. It belongs to Him. It always has. But as we climb to these heights of glory, as we look at this text together, Paul talks about the strengthening of the inner spirit. He mentions five steps that draw us closer, that helps lead us to this summit, to bring us toward God. And he begins by talking about the inner strength. You may... And I'm saying you, 
You may stand in front of a mirror, especially you ladies, and brush or comb your hair. Now, I just buff my head in the morning, so I don't get the opportunity to comb my hair. You also feed your bodies. You, 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 ex, you exercise your bodies, some more than others, but you exercise your bodies, don't you? For what purpose do you do those things? Well, you want to appear good. You want to be healthy. You do those things. So you prepare the outer man, don't you? You, you look at the outer man and you do that. But here's something that's interesting. What did James say in, in James chapter 1? He said, we can stand in front of a mirror and then we can walk away from it and we can forget what we looked like when we were first standing there. But do we put similar effort into our grooming and strengthening of the inner man? See, it's, it's very easy to ignore the inner part of us, the, the soul, the, that which we are created in the image of God. It, it's easy sometimes to do, do that because we forget to provide the, the necessities to it. We forget to provide <clears throat> those things that, <coughs> excuse me, those things that enable us to strengthen the inner man, God's word where we feed upon God's word and the inner man is strengthened. And the reason for that is the inner man is it really reveals who we are. When we realize this, then strengthening the inner man becomes critically important to us. The reason for that is the outer man is decaying. The outer man is actually dying. Paul tells us that very same thing in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. It's dying daily. I'm 62 years old, and I know that I, I'm, not, I'm no longer able to, to do the things that I could do when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. I'm, I can't run as fast. I can't jump as high. I can't throw balls as far as I used to. I don't have the same athletic ability that I had back then. I don't have the same strength physically. The reason for that? It's the outer man is getting older, and day by day, it's decaying, it's, it's dying. But our understanding of this means that we need to exercise and strengthen the inner man because it will live eternally. <clears throat> That's why Paul said, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. <coughs> Let me get a drink of water. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat dried out on me there. <clears throat> but how is the inner man strengthened? Well, the Holy Spirit strengthens the inner man. <clears throat> Therefore, when I consider that, that's one of the reasons why Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19 told us not to quench the Spirit. That's why in this same epistle, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, we're told not to grieve the Spirit. Well, how do we do that? Well, that happens when we fail to walk according to the Spirit, doesn't it? When we walk in the Spirit, what happens? When we walk in the Spirit, we bear the fruit of the Spirit. We heed the instruction of the Spirit. We let the Spirit be our, the, the words in the Scriptures be our guide because they fortify the inner man. See, it is the power of faith through hearing of the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. How does faith come? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to turn to that and be able to open it and study it. That is found, you know, all that is found in scriptures can make man, the man of God then complete. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, that all scriptures is inspired of God. And what is it capable of doing? Well, it's capable of completely, thoroughly furnishing the man of God so that he can be complete, so that he's lacking nothing. And so keep those things in mind as, as we're going along and, and understand that. But that's the Spirit's inner strength. And not only is there the inner strength of the Spirit then, that what we also have is Christ dwells in us. You look at that in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That this passage is specific in pointing out 
that he dwells with us. He dwells in our hearts. And how does he do it? He does it through faith. This is somewhat metaphorical in it, but what he's telling us is, is if we are Christ, Christ abides with us. If we abide in him, he abides in us. Didn't Jesus Christ say that something like that? If we abide in him, he will abide with us. And look at this. Christ dwelling in us is suggesting a oneness. There's harm, a harmony, a unity of purpose. You go back to John chapter 17 and you listen to Jesus' prayer and he was talking about his oneness with God and how he wanted us to be one with them. And, <coughs> excuse me again, that unity of purpose means we're, it's going to be God's purpose. It's going to be a communion. It's going to be a close association. See, Christ dwells in us through his word when his word abides in us. How do I know that? Turn your Bibles to John chapter 15 for just a moment. Just one verse I want you to look at. Verse 7, because there it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, do we understand that? In order for us to abide in him, we have to have his word abiding in us. In order for Christ to be able to dwell in our lives, that spirit-given word must be in us. We must daily feed ourselves, the inner man, with his word so that we can continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Do we understand then the significance of Christ dwelling in us? It means that if I'm a child of God, he walks with me. He goes where I go. He's listening to what I'm saying. He knows what I do every day. You see, Christ doesn't dwell in us only on Sunday. He dwells in us seven days a week, 365 days a year. As long as we live for him, he lives in us. <clears throat> There's a third thing in this text, too, that I want you to consider this morning, and that's this, the incomprehensible love of God. In verses 17 and 18 of this text, that spirit-filled life with the Savior that dwells in us equals this incomprehensible love of God. Now, I want to suggest that, for me at least, it's hard to fathom just how great this love is. We are so fortunate, so blessed to be able to experience a love that is hard to explain. I know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But I still have difficulty comprehending how much love that was. I, exp I know the gift I know Jesus Christ and, and what it means. And I know that what that gift has done for me, that gift of grace in giving us his son. Instead of being lost, I'm found. Instead of being blind, I can now see. But sometimes it's still hard to explain. How vast is God's love? <clears throat> That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not really sure that we can comprehend the full scope of Christ's love and God's love toward us. But I can know with confidence that Christ dwelling in our hearts helps us understand the infinite superiority of the things of God. What I really like about this is how another brother in Christ writes this. It, it helps explain it to me a little bit, but, and it, it, it's not overcomplicated by any means, and yet it's, it doesn't necessarily mean to me that it reveals everything about God's love. But in our text, where it talks about width, length, depth, and height. And this brother said it this way, how broad is his love? Well, he said it's broad enough to take you, take in you and me. How long is his love? Well, it's long enough to stretch from eternity past 
where he chose us in him. That goes back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But it stretches to eternity where he ushers us into our forever home. How deep is his love? Deep enough to reach us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Going back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. You see that, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. And you, you read down to verse 5 on your own. But that's how deep it is. It reached down and pulled us out of the depths of sin. How high is this love? <clears throat> this love is high enough to raise us up to sit with him in heavenly places. If you're still in Ephesians chapter 2, go to verse 6. It says, And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's grace. That's God's love. That's the superiority of the love. That's how how broad and, and wide and deep and, and, and high as, as it is. And yet, I still am not sure that that completely explains it all. But Paul paints us a picture of God's gracious love. It is ours to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And that brings us to the fourth point, the fourth step in this, because it brings us to the fullness, this infinite fullness of God. It is this kind of love that you can build your life upon and that you can be filled. How do we explain all this? <clears throat> now, I'm, again, I'm not sure that I'm able to adequately explain it. However, I look at verses 16 and 17 again, and I know that there is something about this that you may dwell your, in your hearts with, through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. There, there's a base for us to stand on that keeps us moored to Christ. But there's this fullness that needs to come with this in verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, I, I know a few things. I know that he wants me to lead a spirit-filled life. So that means I'm going to have to ha be entrenched in his word. I know that he wants me to be filled with his son and, and his son abide with me. I know that he wants me to be full of him, my God, my creator. And so he wants that inner man to not be lacking anything at all. So when we are filled with God, we take on his character. We, we, we have his characteristics in us. We're full of mercy. We're full of love. We're full of peace, kindness, gentleness, truthfulness, holiness, patience, long-suffering. Keep on going with, with, with all those things. But how do we become filled with that? Sermon on the Mount. You hunger and thirst for righteousness and what will happen? you will be filled. As long as we have that, that longing for God, for his word, we will be filled. And when, if we are filled, then just like Paul told Timothy again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the man of God can be complete, lacking nothing. And I find that so very, very encouraging. But when do we actually do that? How can we be filled? When, well, it happens when we empty ourselves of ourselves. There's a song that we sing that begins, All of self and none of thee. But the, by the end of the song, we sing, None of self and all of thee. That's when we start achieving this fullness. Is when we realize that we're not living for ourselves anymore but we live for our God. And finally, in this, there's this internal power. Remember I said that Paul's second prayer here is wanting us to, to use this power, 
this power of God. But verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, consider this, exceedingly abundantly. It means there is no limit to God's power. There's no limit to his abilities to help us. There's no limit to his graciousness toward us. <clears throat> but the power that works in us means that only we can limit God's power. If we choose to be spiritually weak or to live out our lives as sinners, the power of God's word will have little or no effect in our lives. However, if we decide to grow continually in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, there is no limit to the effectiveness of God's power working in our hearts. That's right. God is willing if we are willing. God is able if we are willing. Well, doesn't that just paint for you a, a wonderful, amazing picture this morning? Because when you look at all of that, it's amazing, isn't it? Is all of this deserved? Well, absolutely not. But that's why it's called grace. Because we can't earn it. And we can't experience the power of God in our lives unless we want him there. And so I want to encourage you in difficult days like we are experiencing now to keep those things in mind, to know that you our God's child, to keep on keeping on with your life daily. And always, always remember who you are and whose you are. You're a child of God. And God's grace will help you reach heights that you cannot reach here on earth. Thank you for joining me and the members of Park Hill Church of Christ on this live stream today. This broadcast is going to be made public and will remain on my personal Facebook page. Come back and, and join us the next time we do this. I'll be producing two more videos this week. One will include the, the study from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2. I will announce when it will be live streamed again. It will very likely will be tomorrow and then Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. Both tomorrow and Wednesday will be 6 p.m. Thank you for joining me. We'll see you the next time.